awesome. Um, hi. <laughs> Firstly, I just I want to say that it's such a huge honor to you know sit here and talk to you. Thank you so much for taking our time. You're welcome to Taiwan. Thank you. Um, so we'll start with how about you introduce yourself and your background in tech and mm -hmm. government. Sure. Um, to you or to the camera? Yes, <laughs> to the camera. Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister in Taiwan. Shu Wei means both digital and plural. So I'm also the minister for plurality. Uh, and I joined the Taiwan cabinet in 2016 after working for two years uh, with the uh, cabinet minister as a reverse mentor on e rulemaking. Uh, and in my previous uh, jobs before entering uh, this line of work, uh, I worked with uh, the open source community a lot, founded a few companies, uh, worked with the Apple Siri team. Um, I think the main idea has always been to increase the bandwidth of communication across sectors. Mm -hmm. So even though I am in the public sector now, I'm still working with the government, not for the government. Wow. Yeah. Love it. Um, so is how did you become interested at the intersection of tech and government? Is it like because of your background? Mm -hmm. Like how mm -hmm. did this interest come from? Well, uh, when I was born uh, in 1981, uh, the year of the personal computers, yes. uh, Taiwan was not a democracy. We were still under the martial law. The martial law only lifted in 87, 88, <clears throat> just when the internet started. Mm -hmm. And we had our first presidential election in 96, uh, which is the year of the World Wide Web and dot com, right? Yes. So for Taiwan, it's not just me. Uh, internet and democracy are not two things. Mm. They literally arrived, roughly, right? Yeah. Uh, on the same, same year. So yeah. internet, democracy uh, worked with each other to make what we call digital democracy. Mm. Wow, that is essentially, you know, my next question, like, could you explain the concept of digital democracy and its significance in Taiwan? Certainly. So, um, if you analyze the current representative democracy, you will quickly see that the bit rate is very low. Mm -hmm. So, if you vote across four presidential candidates yes. every four years, then that's what two bits mm. uploaded per yeah. person to yeah. collective decision making every four years. So, not only small bandwidth, yeah. very high latency. Yeah. Uh, any errors, any problems, it takes years. Or, or at least a quarter, right, mm. to correct that. Mm. But on internet, as we know, internet governance has been from the very beginning multi-stakeholder. Mm. Anyone with an email address can join the internet conversations, yeah. and if there's a new uh, innovation that uh, works provably better, it gets adopted not four years later, but maybe four minutes, yeah. <laughs> four days at most. Yeah. So it works on a much shorter latency. Mm. And across the internet, People, instead of just voting, they can join mailing lists, forums, chat rooms, and so on. So the bandwidth is much higher. And now, as we regularly use video conference and so on, especially yeah. after the pandemic, when people uh, can actually immerse, right, uh, with people they've never met face to face, uh, yeah. the bandwidth has increased almost to the point that is close to face to face conversation. Yeah, I love it. I come from India mm -hmm. and India is a democracy. I would love for you to share like how can you know we also um, adopt digital democracy mm -hmm. or move towards it so that we also move fast. Mm -hmm. Like we are doing it, mm -hmm. but I think there's so much to learn. So what in your experience you think has helped or maybe some obstacles we can talk about mm -hmm. that has come and the way you dealt with it that you think mm -hmm. you know can other democracies can also learn from. Certainly. So digital democracy, we just talk about, is using digital technology to enhance the bandwidth uh, of democratic processes. Yeah. So for example, uh, in Taiwan, before a regulation is introduced, it is announced for usually 60 days uh, on a platform, no matter which ministry it comes from. On the same platform, everyone can start a e-petition. After collecting 5,000 signatures, you can steer a minister in a different way. Oh. The minister has to prove uh, that they have responded point by point to the people's petitions. And on the same website, 
there's a visualization of the budget of each ministry, and you can come in and ask questions on each and every item. And there's also collaborative meetings where people across ministries go to where people are and meet them face to face, and sometimes also live stream across the internet. So I think the point of increasing the bandwidth is not that we abolish election or abolish legislation. That's not what I mean. Yeah. Uh, what I mean is before. A, a draft bill or regulation is even proposed to the legislature. Mm -hmm. Make sure that everybody understands it in their own terms, with their own language, mm -hmm. uh, with the experts in their local community, not just the expert that happens uh, to be in the capital city uh, and so on. So it is also to connect and empower people closest to the pain. Yeah, this is, I love it. Um, do you want to share, like, Mm -hmm. an initiative or an example where mm -hmm. you know there was an uh, we have gotten more mm -hmm. civic participation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what what was difficult because i can imagine the number of people and the different opinions they might mm -hmm. have or viewpoints mm -hmm. they might have right so how to navigate mm -hmm. that and actually arrive at a mm -hmm. you know conclusion or consensus yeah this is a great question um Back in 2015, for example, um, Uber was everywhere in the world. Right. And it connected previously uh, drivers that did not have a professional driver's license, didn't drive taxi for a living, they just go to work or something, uh, and connect them with other people who want to um, ride share uh, their cars and uh, charging them for it. And in doing so, uh, they created an alternative uh, to taxi. Okay. Uh, However, there are many problems uh, with the rollout of this model in many jurisdictions. Uh, because exactly as you said, everybody has a different opinion. Yeah. Existing taxi unions have a different opinion. The consumers uh, sometimes feel that, oh, there's no uh, insurance in this new form of uh, driving and so on. They have an opinion. The Ministry of Taxation have an opinion too, yeah. uh, and economy and everything, right? So back in the days, we hear a lot of very polarized conversations on whether this is the future of sharing economy or this is just an extractive gig economy uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it is the nature of the current representative democracy that only the most polarized issues get airtime mm. on mainstream media and also on social media. Right. And social media uh, polarizes it even more so that people who actually agree on most of the practical points end up focusing their energy mm -hmm. on the one other thing uh, or two things that people don't agree with, right? Mm. Uh, and so this kind of polarization is also enhanced by digital technologies. Yes. So we just said that digital is good for democracy, but it's also good for destroying democracy, yeah. right? right? So back in 2015, instead of debating those polarized points on Facebook or other platforms, we built our own platform, the v platform, and invited people to deliberate, not debate, on the Polis uh, technology. Mm -hmm. And what Polis does, uh, nowadays people can experience it like community notes, it's very similar. Um, people can type their own opinions, not an existing set of surveys. Other people get to like or unlike their surveys uh, mm -hmm. ideas, but not replying to them. And just by taking away the reply button, there's no way for the polarization mm -hmm. to grow. Right? Yeah. If you don't like this, uh, you can probably have something better that uh, gets other people's support. Yeah. And even more importantly, just like community notes, Polis uh, highlights the ones that are bridge making, meaning that people who initially were polarized all converge when they see this breakthrough statement. So for example, uh, there was a statement that said, surge pricing, re responding to demand by uh, increasing the price of the Uber drives yeah. is good, but undercutting existing meters is bad. Mm. Uh, and so instead of just you know uh, making the flexible pricing a abstract concept, this is a very practical, uh, uh, operationalized uh, statement yeah. that brings the two camps together. And so we collected the top 10 or so statements that brings people together and asked uh, taxi drivers, unions, Uber and so on to the same table, live streamed, to respond their commitments to the shared set of principles. So um, more so than pretty much any other uh, Asian country, uh, Taiwan not just legalized Uber, but also fostered the local co-ops and unions and so on into also Uber-like 
um, associations. And so it's a kind of multi-stakeholder co-creation from conflict. So not afraid of conflict, mm -hmm. turning conflict into co-creation is the goal of digital democracy. Wow. Is this platform, can this be used by mm -hmm. anybody else? Like any? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, entirely open source. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I mentioned, the police algorithm not just gets adopted by many countries, you can check it out on the police website, but it also inspired uh, follow algorithms, including community notes uh, in x.com. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. I love it. Um, actually, yeah, that was, so my next question was essentially, I think which mm -hmm. we have covered, are there specific projects that demonstrate the potential of, you know, mm -hmm. that have used open source principles mm -hmm. for the benefit of society? Yes. So in addition to Polis, we're now also working along with the Collective Intelligence Project, OpenAI, Anthropic and Friends, Creative Commons, a new generation of the same idea as Polis, but now with language models. So before uh, language models, um, Polis essentially relied on crowd moderation, but it doesn't scale as well if you have 20,000 different statements. <laughs> because nobody can read through 20,000 statements. Right. Uh, and the great thing about language model is that it can synthesize very well. Mm. So on Polis, if you see three or four different clusters, instead mm. of reading through the top statements, we can just ask the language models to synthesize the avatar from each cluster. Wow. It's like an executive summary that talks back to you. Wow. So yeah. we work with uh, Talk to the City, uh, and many other uh, projects in synthesizing this deliberative experience so that even with tens of thousands of people all chiming in uh, mm -hmm. to any person, they just interact with two or three avatars uh, and they can have a real in-depth conversation in which each statement is backed by a specific statement or even a specific point in a video. Uh, that goes back to original source. So it's not hallucination or confabulation. This right. is just a way to synthesize an uh, augmented deliberation. Wow. Yeah, this, I think this will make it scalable, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And we already use it uh, to okay. align uh, Taiwan's own language model. The Taida, the Trustworthy AI Dialogue Engine, yeah. is aligned by taking the input of the online POTUS conversations and so on, and uh, which co-created what's called a constitutional document for constitutional AI, yeah. so that this current generation of smaller language models can use this set of constitutional principles co-created to align, that is to say, to calibrate an even stronger, more powerful version mm -hmm. of the AI model. So this is called super alignment, and this allows us to simply co-create a document that can then be passed on from smaller models to larger to even larger models so that they keep responding to people's collective wish. Wow. Uh, I'm curious how, like, how do you get time to read mm -hmm. so much and you mm -hmm. know so much like despite having such a busy schedule? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I do want to use all these technologies in my flow of work so that I have a practical understanding, not just a abstract understanding. For example, uh, this laptop, which I got uh, around March uh, this year, um, has 96 uh, gigabytes of uh, VRAM and RAM. It is a Mac, so it's the same. Uh, and I've been using local open source, uh, or at least open weight language models to write my email replies ever since then, oh. right? So in uh, doing so, I first ensure that it's fine-tuned on my own laptop. So it works in airplane mode. Yeah. My email uh, draft doesn't go anywhere else, uh, but it also uh, let me understand the ongoing progress of the uh, quantized models, quantized mm. fine-tuning, and things like that. And so I firmly believe in the hands-on uh, imperative. If there is no way for us to predict uh, where the technology uh, will lead without immersing ourselves in the technology. 100%. Mm -hmm. um, this makes me wonder, like, you have such a good hold over, like, what's mm -hmm. happening and, you know, on you're on top of it. Mm -hmm. But how do we... Because if we have to actually, you know, bring a change and make it scalable, we also need to have other people or other stakeholders, mm -hmm. maybe other ministries, 
you know understand it the way mm-hmm. we understand it mm-hmm. right so how does that happen because that can happen mm-hmm. right especially in a democracy right mm-hmm. where one department or maybe one uh, mm-hmm. you know stakeholder understands it but how do we make sure like others are also mm-hmm. moving along because then only it will be able to actually right happen or like be yeah, scaled definitely that's a great question um so for example let's august just a couple of weeks before the ministry uh, started uh, our website went online and in the same hour pretty much all other website in other ministries was under attack uh, following speaker pelosi's visit uh, to taiwan so this huge amount of ddos uh, denial of service attacks 23 times more than the previous peak so a lot of volume just to take those ministries website down but our website what wasn't down uh, for even just a second actually i publicly say so uh, and so we got a lot of free testing uh, and in part thanks uh, to this message that says everybody can help us uh, to back up our website you just install the brave browser or a ipfs node and you pin ipns moda.gov.tw and suddenly our website is backed up uh, in your computer so by enlisting the web3 communities instead of uh, telling other ministers that, oh, IPFS, decentralized technology, whatever, yes. um, this lets them see it in action. Like mm-hmm. uh, their websites, because there's no way for other people to back it up, um, was down <laughs> for a few hours, uh, but us, uh, we kept afloat. So after that event, many ministries asked us, uh, what is the trick? Because their uh, vendors, their system integrators, say that it's impossible to back their website up to IPFS Mm. because it was designed differently. It is not a static uh, snapshot, right? Uh, And so then we uh, open sourced the entire technological stack of our website so that other ministries can simply tell their vendors to copy and build from this idea and basically do most of the rendering in JavaScript and client and so on, so that they can also publish over static page, including IPFS, but also ordinary CDN. And so basically the idea is to show instead of tell. And once we show, we also open up as public code our implementation. So with zero budget burden, they can also incorporate it in their own systems. Yeah. I love it. Uh, that is one of the things that I've also learned from Kevin, mm-hmm. who I work with, right? Mm-hmm. Like show over tell, like that mm-hmm. is such a huge impact. I think, yeah, I believe like if more and more people like you mm-hmm. are at this position for youngsters like us, it becomes even more fascinating to work with the government, to work for the country. Otherwise, what happens is we sort mm-hmm. of like run away a little bit because it's always mm-hmm. traditional methods and those kind of things. Yes. I think this is a mm-hmm. big shift. Like I can mm-hmm. feel that curiosity and excitement in you know talking to you and understanding how things can be changed and um, you know how we can actually do like change at system level. Mm-hmm. And this can happen when we have leaders like you. So I just mm-hmm. want to say thank you so much for. No, thank you. you know, <laughs> Yeah. Doing what you do. Uh, thank you, the community, for doing all the research. Right? <laughs> I'm, in a sense, just a conduit uh, through which those research enters production. Yes. Uh, Great. So, um, okay, so moving on, uh, what is Gov Zero? Could mm-hmm, you give sure. like an overview of Gov mm-hmm. Zero and how it has impacted the civic engagement? Yeah, I joined the Gov Zero movement uh, around the end of 2012 when it first started. The initial idea was really simple. It is taking a governmental website that people find difficult to understand, which always is something that GOV, the TW, and change it all to a zero. Okay. So instead of um, join the GOV, the TW, uh, you type join the G0V, the TW, which looks almost the same, mm-hmm. and get into this kind of shadow government, a forked uh, version yeah. of the government. Okay. And uh, the idea of forking in open source uh, is essential because a fork of the governmental website is not denying the value the original one brings. Okay. It is just steering it to a slightly different direction that is more participatory and transparent. So the initial one was 
budget the G0V.TW uh, and the team uh, who worked on it was motivated by a YouTube advertisement at the time uh, the administration pushed out that says you know the budget impossible to understand let's just do it without understanding it uh, which was the first uh, administration's YouTube advertisement to be flagged as scam <laughs> and taken down briefly <laughs> right and people really don't like the message right because if the budget the PDF printouts are difficult to understand it's not the people's problem it's the government's problem yeah. right? uh, and so Gov Zero visualized the budget uh, into very easy to understand uh, boxes and uh, circles and so on interactive ones and as I mentioned you can click into each one and uh, type a Q&A and so on so um, this entire system is now back at join.gov.tw. It's merged back. Another thing about forking is that some forks are soft forks, right? Yeah. They are forked with the intention of being merged back. Right. And that describes many Gov Zero projects. They are creative reimagination of governmental websites and processes, but always with the hope that because it's open source, if it worked really well, then it's like research where, again, the government is like the deployments, they get merged back the next quarter. Right. Wow. Amazing. Um, I'm just, you know, there's one question that is coming to my mind, sure. which we discussed, I think, two mm -hmm. questions back. Mm -hmm. um, like there are so much, there's so much happening in terms of making it easy for people to understand mm -hmm. budgets and everything, mm -hmm. right? But do you think it might be difficult to get people interested in it despite mm -hmm. making it easy mm -hmm. because sometimes what I have observed is like on an individual level if it is not really affecting us people don't really care mm -hmm. right how do we get people to care about mm -hmm. it because we can simplify it yeah, and, this know. is a great great question very interesting question on the join platform we observed people who spend the most time on it are around 17 years old and 70 years old <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, I mean, I guess both of them have more time on their hands, but, but, also, but also they care more about uh, the next generation uh, compared to the um, you know, people in the middle. The people in the middle have duties, responsibilities yeah. that they have to uh, immediately take care of, but the people who are 17 and 70, they think longer term, they think on longer horizons, yeah. right? So they are natural allies. And we get e-petitions, for example, the one about banning the plastic straws a few years back uh, mm -hmm. from our signature uh, Boba uh, Bobo C takeouts. Right? Uh, and so this kind of petitions uh, doesn't um, come from nowhere. It comes from our basic education. And the basic education, because of our new curriculum, uh, we de-emphasized uh, road memorization, literacy, and so on. In yeah. fact, we change all occurrence of literacy into competence. So instead of consuming something, we want to co-create something. Uh, competence is when you're a producer, right? Yeah. So actually, that petition was a civics class assignment from the teacher to high school students oh. saying find something that you feel wrong and start a petition about it. Wow. Right? So it's like starting social movements as yeah. part of your schoolwork. Yes. Right? So instead of taking Friday off to strike, your Friday <laughs> is doing yes. petitions. Right? Yes. <laughs> so by creating the mechanism to uh, encourage participation before they even turn 18, it yeah. actually prepares the society to look at the future voices mm -hmm. and with the help of people who are around 70 years old uh, to amplify it uh, on the internet and so on. It very quickly got 5,000 signatures and we met and had a multi-stakeholder meeting and so on. And so the point I'm making is that uh, it is not for the government to ask people to care. Okay. There are already people caring about such topics. It was just that maybe they're too young, maybe they don't have a uh, constituency uh, for a legislator to represent them and so on. But if we uh, create mechanism so they can form ally uh, with people who they have never met in real life, then they actually assemble together into new form of associations uh, so as to kind of decentralize right, uh, the autonomy of organizations. Yeah. Wow. Um I can talk to you for the whole day. Yes, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> My next meeting is more than an hour away, so, <laughs> so we can talk more. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, 
I am so already so interested in talking like talking to you about the book mm-hmm. that is yeah, plurality yes. plurality dot net. Mm-hmm. So um, before getting a little bit into book, what is plurality? Sure. So plurality uh, means technology to foster collaboration across diversity. So there are two dimensions. One uh, is about building deeper and deeper connections. There are technologies that, as we mentioned, increase the bandwidth of communication. When I was young, uh, when we were in different countries, we can only really type uh, in real time or write long emails or whatever. Uh, but now we can just put on some VR and R uh, and send each other our codec avatars yes. right? and feel that we're in the same room, right? Yes. So, so there are uh, deeper collaborations. Uh, that's one line of technology. There's yes. another line of technology that extends um, the organizational capabilities of people. For example, if we just meet people in the same room, um, around 150 people, uh, we cannot keep track of each other anymore. When there's more than that number, Dunbar's number, uh, we cease to operate in a concrete person-to-person level. Mm-hmm. We move to a hierarchical level. And this is not because uh, we're slaves of bureaucracy or whatever. This is just a wet way, a restriction uh, of our brains, our minds. Uh, but as I mentioned, if you uh, make use of synthetic avatars, of augmented deliberation, mm-hmm. you can break through that barrier and have uh, meaningful conversations with tens of thousands of people uh, to compress their common ideas but not losing the nuance. Right? So if you have participated in consultations uh, in the old, uh, bad old days, by the time it reaches the cabinet ministers, yeah. it's just five A4 pages yes. and all the nuances were lost. Mm. The local people may already have a very good solution but with more parameters like all these sectors need to coordinate in very specific way, mm-hmm. but once it's compressed to an executive summary, because of lossy compression, yeah. that is lost, right? right? right. Uh, but now with language models and so on, we can actually keep the nuance. And I can mm-hmm. just type questions or say, oh, now I have a concrete situation. How would the original tens of thousands of people's avatar deal with mm-hmm. this, uh, citing right. back to their original communications? Right. And so in this way, it scales not just listening, but also conversation. So we have technologies for scaling, mm-hmm. and we have technologies for deeper connections. Yeah. And instead of having them like being opposite of each other, mm-hmm. which is sometimes portrayed, we think of them as two dimensions. So plurality is to both increase collaboration and also increase diversity. Mm-hmm. So it is the general direction of developing technologies that doesn't reduce people to just um, you know, dollars or whatever, uh, transactional things as we scale, right. because there are many ways to uh, scale things if you conflate everything into just a dollar value. Uh, and it is also not developing virtual reality mm-hmm. that ends up becoming solo reality. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was just me and, and my imaginations, <laughs> yeah. right? which is reducing diversity, yes. right? So, yes. so deeper, but also more diverse. Yeah. I love it. But again, like my mind is just, you know, going back to one of the questions that we discussed, which sort of relates to this, um, you know, for increasing diversity, uh, like how do we get, you know, one of the things you said, like we need more local people to be involved, not just experts, mm-hmm. right? And the more groups we reach that increases diversity. But how do we get them to understand? Like how do we get them mm-hmm. to understand it, right? So because experts can understand a lot of things, mm-hmm. but how do we disseminate the information in a way mm-hmm. which is understood by the mm-hmm. that particular local group? Yeah. Um, I really believe that we should bring technology to where people are, instead of asking people to understand technology. Mm-hmm. Right? If Again, this is like those budget PDF files. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we cannot make our budgets understandable by the people, mm-hmm. that's on us. Yeah. That's not on the people. Okay. Um, and so I think one of the main ideas that we've worked with is to simply ask the people in the local um, issues and so on and what they want the government, the ministers and so on uh, to, to learn, to respond to. 
We even have a system called reverse mentorship that asks people around Taiwan, younger than 35, like people who are in kind of on the very cusp of social innovation, and invite them into the cabinet. So each minister can appoint uh, one or two reverse mentors uh, to, to mentor them uh, in the way of the future, so to speak. Wow. And they, these young reverse mentors, form their own youth advisory council that can summon the ministers and so on to the places they think that the ministers should understand. Uh, so I think it is those reverse mentors. I used to be one, but now I'm very old. I'm 41 now, <laughs> <laughs> 42. <laughs> so I have my own reverse mentor. Uh, that's Mesh Bing Fong, by the way, oh, <laughs> from our yes. ministry. Yeah, uh, who, to, to lead the way. Um, and so I think by flipping the idea of mentorship, we can flip the original thinking of we need to uh, pedagogically teach the people the way of technology. No, it's not like that. It is the people, and especially young people, who have worked deeply with a locality, with a community, to ask the policymakers, the cabinet ministers, and so on, to adapt the technology they're developing to the people's needs. Yes. Can I be your endorsement, though? <laughs> Um, would you like to be uh, a Taiwanese? <laughs> I would love to. Yeah, I can. I was, yeah. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I am so inspired by mm -hmm. the work that Taiwan is doing, mm -hmm. and especially you. I was wondering that how about I come here next mm -hmm. year, uh, enroll myself in National Taiwan University to learn Mandarin, mm -hmm. okay. and I work with you. Awesome. And because mm -hmm. I feel the work that is happening here is just baffles me. It's mm -hmm. so incredible. And when I, you know, work in a different setting, mm -hmm. in Web3 also, like mm -hmm. in different, you know, I think there's a lot, like there is still gap mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. world needs to know what is happening here. And we need to sort of like do so much more because you are so open mm -hmm. to try and experiment. Yeah, so definitely. Um, Vitalik, uh, Glenn Weil and many friends uh, they are holders of the Taiwan Gold Card, and in yes. fact, uh, we never uh, defined Gold Card to uh, to only the elites, right? The best universities, the ones with the highest paying jobs. No, anyone who can prove they have contributed to the Internet Commons uh, for eight years, uh, whether it's blogging or communication or open source documentation doesn't matter. As long as there is a way to verify that you have contributed for eight years, you get a gold card. Uh, you become our resident. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, when young, mm -hmm. so I'm not young. <laughs> okay. for eight years. But really? Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, I'm 26. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so when, when did you first uh, encounter the open source uh, Web3 community? <laughs> Thank yeah. you for asking. Uh, <laughs> it's not that old. Like I'm comparatively very new. So it's been two, three years. Uh, three years. When I mm -hmm. actually like sort of started knowing what this is happening and. I was frustrated with my job mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like so fed up of the old methods and everything that you know they were using and then I got introduced to this whole space of open source and web3 and that's how I started. Okay. And well, I mean, I can still look at your contribution because a ministerial recommendation uh, can actually substitute for eight years of oh, <laughs> experience. Yes. Yeah. So maybe we should talk after the interview. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Great. So, uh, by the way, because we are talking about plurality.net, mm -hmm. I want to share that we are starting a book club for plurality.net. Oh, wow. okay. Yes. And Glenn has been also very kind and he said, mm -hmm. like, he will try to join some sessions mm -hmm. so we are around 15 people mm -hmm. who will be meeting bi-weekly and discussing the concepts of the book so okay that's will, awesome yes yeah I think uh, we really uh, try something new this time because when Glenn asked me to co-write a book I said the only requirement is to relinquish the copyright and publish as we write uh, because yes. we know that this field progresses so quickly 
So if we do it the traditional way, the entire book may be outdated <laughs> by the time it's published. Yes. It's only by working in the open and with book clubs everywhere okay. can we uh, keep updated on what's actually happening in the field. Yeah, that is that mm -hmm. is amazing because it it's so fast. Like mm -hmm. you know, you wake up and things change. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I just wanted to share. So anybody who is watching this, if you are interested in joining the book club, uh, you can drop a comment in this channel or reach out to me at Sejal Rikhan so I'm initiating the book club. Great. Um, okay, <laughs> so many questions I have in my mind sure. right now. Um, yeah, so essentially like because we're talking about the book, what, like can you share any personal experience or insights that actually inspired you to write this book? Like, sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think the motivation for me um, is that by the time that I share with the world what we did during the pandemic uh, without a single day of uh, lockdown so people can always travel between cities during the whole three years thanks to very innovative use of collaborative technology or how we countered uh, the kind of threats of information manipulation again without administrative takedowns and so on uh, I usually conclude uh, with my poem uh, which is the, my job description right the one that I pinned on my Twitter yes. right yes. Uh, which ends with the line uh, whenever we hear the singularity is near let us always remember the plurality is here uh, and usually by that point people become very inspired and ask me okay how exactly <laughs> do we make sure that plurality is here yeah. and can apply to our society because um, without such a book it feels a little bit like Taiwan exceptionalism <laughs> it feels a little bit like you know Taiwan is some, something else entirely right <laughs> uh, but it is not like that right. back in 2014 the administration had the public trust level of maybe 9%. So we also had a time where there's like absolutely no trust in the democratic uh, institution. Uh, we also had deep divides uh, between the peoples. Uh, we have actually uh, more than 20 national languages, 16 or more indigenous nations. Uh, that's a part of Taiwan that was not very well known uh, to the world. Yeah. So I think the point here is that Taiwan evolved this uh, plurality uh, direction, not because we're so exceptional, but because we made some good choices in specific points mm. uh, in history. And those choices, any jurisdiction can make those too. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I think turning something poetic and inspiring into something that's more like a handbook, something practical, it is the original motivation. Wow. It seems like you need to have the right intent mm -hmm. and then you know, you can mm -hmm. do it, mm -hmm. love it. Um, yeah, so before, you know, leaving the book topic, just last sure. question on the book, uh, what do you see as the most significant challenges facing pluralistic societies in digital space? Yeah. And what are the some potential mm -hmm. solutions? Yeah, definitely, I think it is uh, techno-solutionism, right? So if uh, instead of what we just talked about, which is adapting technologies and aligning it to societal needs and continuously aligning these two together, um, there is um, a strong tendency uh, in some uh, technological communities uh, to simply say, no, no, let's just solve a problem, mm. right? Let's solve democracy, <laughs> right? Let's solve uh, this or that, uh, right. which uh, by which they actually mean, uh, let's through network effect or whatever, uh, build something that is so widespread and adopted mm. that uh, the old system simply goes away. Uh, the old institutions, yeah. we can ignore them uh, and just solve everything with the new uh, institutions. Yeah. Uh, frankly speaking, there were some uh, people like that in crypto communities too, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, all the coordination failures, all the mm -hmm. issues with old finance and so on. And let's just build entirely new systems mm -hmm. and take over the world and so the old problems just go away. Mm -hmm. um, after a few years, of course, we now see that's probably not the yeah. case uh, because there really is no reason for everyday people yeah. to switch to a new system if the legitimacy is more or less the same uh, even though it may be more convenient more secure mm -hmm. and so on you know inertia has um, taken um, the upper hand 
in most of the societies. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting frustrated yeah. and say, oh, you know, societal inertia <laughs> or whatever, right? No, yeah. let, let's just say, uh, however, we can adapt those technologies and put it in the hands mm -hmm. of these people. So instead of solving their problems, empowering them yeah. so they can solve their problems. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and so instead of the technologies becoming a savior, right, we actually become just kind of bootloaders, right, <laughs> uh, who bootstrap conditions on right. top of which people can work together. Yeah. Right? And so I think this viewpoint is now gaining ground. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the past few years, we did see a lot of uh, techno solutionism. Um, I wonder, like, you know, I know you do public office hours, yes. right? So mm -hmm. I read your conversation with, uh, I think, Ethereum Foundation, where you mentioned how you want to do more QF rounds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so do you want to talk about what interests you and mm -hmm. what do you think about that? And do you plan to do something like that? In that? Yeah, we're in the middle of a QF round right now. We work with the yeah. three leading crowdfunding um enterprises in Taiwan uh, and we essentially asked the society for um, ideas that uh, further the ESG uh, goals, the SDG goals, um, using communication technologies. So uh, the only thing we ask is that it needs to be uh, portable. That is to say, for example, um, there's a idea that says instead of bringing sign language interpreters to each person uh, in need, how about let's just use high bandwidth and some machine learning uh, to connect them uh, together so that everybody can have access not just to sign interpreters but also real-time captions and so on, right? So this idea in itself um, doesn't immediately um, have a product market fit. Um, it does need a lot of governmental funding. But from the government side, it is actually much more cost-effective than hiring individual uh, sign language interpreters, yeah. right? Because these interpreters are, still have a job, but now they can serve much more people and spend more time uh, interpreting instead of traveling from this client to the other, right? Yeah. So it, it improves everybody's well-being. Yeah. And so for uh, things like this, we just ask them to write up their proposal, uh, ask the crowdfunding, and the, each crowdfunding site agreed uh, to publish um, the, the tally of the square root of each individual com uh, contribution yeah. so that the ones that have the highest sum of the square root uh, gets the highest award uh, mm -hmm. from the government. Mm -hmm. So this is a new middle way uh, between the committee uh, voting from the small committee and the simple matching funding uh, where a large um, social enterprise can just dominate the, mm -hmm. the, the, the uh, matching funding. Uh, it is somewhere in the middle. Uh, so we're currently uh, in the first round mm. as a ministry for this kind oh. of uh, experiment. Wow. Yeah. yeah, because I feel like I was, you know, wondering, even when I was talking to Kevin, Gitcoin, like they are, mm -hmm. you know, actually mm -hmm. building the tech where mm -hmm. anybody can experiment with different funding mechanisms. Right. QF is one and then there is retroactive mm -hmm. uh, funding, which is, mm -hmm. uh, which I've I'm really fond of because yes. it just you know rewards people and uh, who have contributed in a meaningful mm -hmm. way. But my only fear is like I just hope that anything that is getting built is useful to people even outside mm -hmm. that bubble, right? So mm -hmm. that is why I feel like what should we do to mm -hmm. use the tech like that, mm -hmm. which can enable these mechanisms yeah. here. Yeah, this is uh, very intriguing. Um, I think just as we work with the leading established crowdfunding sites, not running our own QF run, but running it with the three Taiwanese enterprises that already have experience connecting the impact investors, the social entrepreneurs, and so on together, uh, we also think retro funding uh, doesn't exist in a bubble or in a vacuum, mm -hmm. but we need to connect it with a existing ecosystem around what's usually called pay for result uh, or pay for success or social impact bond, many uh, names. Right. <laughs> but there are existing communities, yeah. uh, again, connecting impact investors and the uh, public sector mm -hmm. based on idea of measurable outcomes. Uh, and so instead of saying, you know, retro funding is 
mostly digital or mostly Web3 or mostly uh, new innovation. Yeah. We simply say, uh, actually, it is just a way uh, to streamline the process mm -hmm. of what existing pay for result yeah. uh, arrangement is trying to do. So again, not as a savior or a solution provider, but rather as someone who empowers the bootstrapping uh, of such uh, processes. So it can scale better while working as deeply as before with the existing yeah. communities. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, would love to, um, like we are already doing like a live round which is mm -hmm. happening. So we spin up a live round in funding the Commons mm -hmm. event that happened recently where contributors of Gov Zero, Dow Zero, and Fat Dow, they mm -hmm. applied and we had a small matching pool which was raised by the organizers around $3,000 and mm -hmm. people have talked about their contribution in these organizations. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so <laughs> we're doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think these kind of live demos is really key because individually those ideas, hyper certificates, uh, retro funding, quadratic funding and so on, um, they look good uh, as a formula, but yes. it's very difficult for people to think uh, in concrete terms like how should we coordinate, who will I lobby, does lobby even work <laughs> in, exactly. in, such, right, in exactly. such mechanisms. Yeah. So I think that the key here is be like a sandbox. That is to say, with a um, very kind of gentle and humble matching fund level, not immediately throwing billions of dollars into exactly. it. And, and frankly speaking, let it fail. Let it fail in interesting ways. Uh, yes. Because it's open source. When it fails, you keep both parts. Right? <laughs> and then you can recombine to make it yes. better. I love the fact that uh -huh. you know you said that, like uh -huh. you know, yeah, fail fast, <laughs> fail fast. That fail is fast. so important because yeah. it can't be perfect, and it just uh, gives you so much learnings that you know mm -hmm. this is how it needs to be done, and this is why people couldn't understand it. Sometimes mm -hmm. we think that, for example, we did an experiment, like we work with, like I work with Green Pill Network, right? Mm -hmm. So we have local chapters. We have Green Pill India, Green mm -hmm. Pill Taiwan, we have Green Pill, you know, China. So. Uh, we did this experiment where we integrated hypercerts on the software that Gitcoin has built and when people had their grants displayed, each application had hypercerts displayed. Our hypothesis was that when people come in to donate, they mm -hmm. will look at the hypercerts and they will decide whether they want to support or not. To our surprise, nobody looked at it. Like people, for example, Greenpeace Japan is raising funds and they asked their members to vote for them. They came, they voted for them and they went. Like they did not look at the hyper search. Exactly. So a lot of times we assume, mm -hmm. right? So there has to be different ways. Maybe people didn't understand how to actually interpret that hyper mm -hmm. search, right? So there are different things, but I think it's super important to fail fast and, you know, do it like a pilot round or like live demos so that it helps us and people understand. To move, right? To, to <laughs> Break fast and move things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So a lot of serious mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. Now we will move to a very interesting section, okay. which is let's know Minister Audrey. Of course. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's you can choose to answer like two, three lines or expand, but it's fun questions. Fun um, questions. Okay. okay. So what inspired you to start coding at such a young age? Yeah. I was inspired by lack of computers. Right. I read about programming. I had no personal computer at home, uh, so I took an A4 paper and wrote uh, QWERTY <laughs> on it, the keyboard. Yes. And every morning I would wake up, I was eight years old, would wake up, uh, type CLS enter, and use an eraser <laughs> to erase the pencil <laughs> that was printed uh, on the screen. Right. So I, I programmed without a computer uh, for quite a while. Uh, and then after a few weeks, I think my parents finally fed up <laughs> with me and got me a personal computer. So from the very beginning, I think of computers as uh, extension of my mind. Instead of uh, playing computer games, I spend most of my time just looking at computer games and rewrote them uh, from scratch. Uh, and uh, even before I had access uh, to you know more powerful computers and so on, I would simulate uh, what they how they would act uh, on piece of paper or on you know smaller computers. So I, I think the the point I want to make is that computational thinking doesn't even need a powerful computer. Mm -hmm. It is just a way to uh, work with the problem that doesn't fit our brains. Uh, you can decompose it, you can turn them into functional modular components and so on. And at, at some point, you will see that there's no problem too large 
if you can decompose it logically and just work on the one part that you feel like working on because other people are working on other parts. So we can't just kind of coordinate together. I love you said that com I always thought computer as the extension of computer. Mm -hmm. like, that's such a genius thing to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> love it. Okay, so what is your favorite tech tool? Like one tech tool you can't live without. Oh, that's definitely my eyeglass. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I think, the a pinnacle of assistive technology, uh, which always put the dignity of the person. Uh, and uh, I love the fact that it doesn't push advertisements uh, to my retina. <laughs> it is very transparent. Yes. <laughs> and I can fix it myself or bring it to the people down the uh, street to fix it without signing a NDA or paying three million <laughs> licensing fees. And so, yes. so I think all technology should be like my eyeglass. Yes. Wow, love it. Um, what is the recent tech innovation that has excited you the most? Um, I think uh, just today, right? I, I read uh, on Nature uh, that the DeepMind team have successfully uh, introduced a, a new novel program that tackle the uh, mathematics uh, combinatorial uh, problems better uh, mm -hmm. using language models as a part of evolutionary uh, algorithm. Mm -hmm. So in evolutionary programming, uh, you rely on essentially rolling the dice, right, mm -hmm. to introduce mutations yeah. uh, to programs, so it solves problems better. But instead of just rolling a dice, they are now randomly sampling language models. Mm -hmm. So it moves through the search space much, much faster. And so this is one good step toward a extension of the planning part of our mind, mm. not just the recital part yeah. of our mind, but can basically move the researchers, human researchers, uh, from a point of they have to both think and operationalize the research mm. to just strategizing about the research. Yeah. Wow. Uh, this makes me want to ask, what are your sources of information? Like, what do you consume? Like you said, you read this on nature, right? Like, yeah. So what are the different um, mm -hmm. uh, sources that you sort of go to for reading latest? It, 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 is, it is very random, <laughs> right? Um, I, of course, subscribe to some Substacks. Uh, mm -hmm. I read um, uh, extra.com feed. I recently reactivated my less wrong account. <laughs> <laughs> and so on and so forth. Right, Hacker News, um, Reddit, uh, and so on. So uh, I think it's not what I browse. Mm. I, I seldom scroll mm. my uh, devices. I yeah. insist on using a stylus mm. so that it's almost always intentional. So I don't do doom scrolling or any sort of uh, scrolling. Mm. I wake up, I think of a keyword I want to explore today, and I search for it uh, across different uh, media and platforms and so on. And uh, if I uh, go on social media, which yeah. I don't often, um, everybody know in Taiwan that my Facebook feed is uh, empty. Oh. <laughs> it was just uh, a, a, a inspiring quote. Uh -huh. um, and this is called Facebook feed eradicator. So basically, <laughs> I don't let AI take off, take over my mind. Yeah. Uh, and I always begin with a intention, uh, either from a stylus or typing a keyword or things like that. Mm. Wow. Okay. Um, do you have any hobbies that people would be surprised to know about? I'm sorry. Do you have any hobbies? That hobbies. people would be surprised to know about. Well, I I love hugging trolls. <laughs> <laughs> Troll hugging is my hobby. Uh, oh. I would uh, just sometimes uh, search uh, for people talking about me or the policy that I'm doing, uh, and if they write, you know, 100 very angry words, uh, like toxic words and so on, but even just three words in those 100 words, I can creatively interpret it as constructive. Mm. I would just engage with that person, wow. but just on those three words. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so not only this turns um, people who were adversarial into good friends, mm. but also it yeah. sets an example that really it doesn't matter um, it, what toxic or trollish or whatever things you say, mm. uh, you can always, it's just like you know wearing a eyeglass. Yeah. You can always uh, post filter the, the incoming input so it only uh, engages you in a positive way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
one book that has significantly influenced your thinking? Oh, a book, uh, plurality, uh, but that's a cheap <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, so I think one of the books that I spend the most time on uh, is the Ministry of Education Dictionary. Uh, my first uh, project that I led in the Zero Movement is called Moedict, the Ministry of Education Dictionary, in which we not only uh, increase the digitalization like mobile browsing and things like that mm -hmm. across the, the MOE uh, dictionaries, but we also crowdsourced um, typo spotting, corrections, uh, fixing Unicode, whatever, right? So to modernize a very old dictionary into something that is digital with the help of tens of thousands of people. Uh, so this is one of my first uh, engagement with the crowdsourcing world uh, and the same methodology has then been applied uh, to indigenous language dictionaries and many other dictionaries. So I think this is quite symbolic really because dictionary is one of the most top-down things mm. ever, right? <laughs> Either by, by a, a prestigious university or a government or things like that. Uh, but urban dictionaries, uh, wiki dictionaries, and the Moe dictionary proved that the locally sourced, community sourced dictionary doesn't need to compete uh, with the official one. Actually, it can build upon mm. the official one. And our contributions were actually merged back by the Ministry of Education. And I was then invited to join the curriculum committee for basic education. <laughs> so this is actually my first position in the government, so it holds a special uh, place in my heart. Wow, yeah. love it. Who has been your greatest role model or mentor in your career? Hmm. Well, that's kind of difficult to choose, but I think Larry Wall uh, of Pearl and Patch and RN fame um, mm -hmm. probably has the most influence uh, on how I worked with people, especially across the internet. Um, Larry always um, emphasized the importance of plurality. In, in fact, um, you know, uh, like, you know, talking about singularities near and so on, and don't forget about, about plurality, I first heard that from Larry Wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I turned that into a poem. <laughs> but the yeah. original idea of uh, using the idea of plurality to overcome the threat of singularity. That came from Larry. Okay, amazing. Great. Uh, okay, I'm almost towards the end. Mm -hmm. uh, so, two, three more questions. Sure. Paint me a picture of the world you want to live in. Hmm. Sure. Um, so, I think a future where there's always more freedom to future generations is the kind of future that I want to live in. I don't want the future to be a more constrained space just because the current generation feels what's best for the world. Mm -hmm. If we optimize for a local optimum, uh, then we actually foreclose and deny possibilities for future generations to, to do better. So it's always our hashtag to say, hashtag free the future. So I think this is a, a very meta answer to your question. Like I want the kind of future that is more co-determined by people in the future than by me. Wow, love it. <laughs> um, okay, so what do you want to be? What do you want to see? Which, like you know, like what do you want to be different in the world in next six months? Mm. So. Um, I think in the next six months, we need to pay very close attention um, whether people see AI as something assistive, that is to say augmenting how people coordinate, or something that is authoritarian, that is to say dictating how people should behave. Because we are at the cusp of agentic AI now. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, the Nature paper is one small step forward from a machine <laughs> that uh, can actually uh, open up the possibilities to move toward very agentic AI. Mm. Uh, but a very agentic AI that prescribes certain interactions also forecloses possibilities for people to interact together if they have to be mediated through that agentic AI that makes essentially decisions uh, not with us but for 
us, yeah. right? So I think uh, the most important thing in the next six months is democratic alignment. And I, by that, I mean a continuous aligning, like co-domestication, really, yeah. uh, between uh, the humanity and the assistive AIs that we produce. Mm -hmm. If there's no feedback loop, if it is just the humanity setting the initial conditions and the agentic AI evolving by itself to a point where uh, they cease to align with what the next generations of human thinking is, then we risk uh, just foreclosing history at one point in history. And then everything else after that is just a local optimum. Right. Okay. Love it. Okay. Uh, last. Okay, second last question. What type of music do you like? Hmm. Any kind of music, right? <laughs> so uh, sometimes I would just, just randomly play uh, a, a music track. With that said, um, I tend to listen to music that loops uh, an entire day. So for an entire day, uh, I would just listen to one kind of music or even just one song. Uh, but the next day, I would wake up and intentionally switch to something different mm -hmm. uh, so as to mark a clear beginning. Okay, okay. okay. last question. Mm -hmm. um, share, can you share a glimpse of your typical day? What does mm -hmm. your day look like? Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, so today, right, um, I woke up, I went to the National Science and Technology Advisory meeting, uh, and then I'm doing this interview, and then uh, I'm having a conversation uh, with my staff uh, to prepare for the live streamed uh, response mm -hmm. uh, to my staff's wishes. Because every month uh, we do a live stream where I basically have a virtual town hall with all the ministry and administration's people, mm -hmm. and the agenda is directly set on a discourse forum uh, mm -hmm. internally uh, by our staff. And again, they can get 30 petitions, collections, uh, signatures, and so on, and they can essentially force me <laughs> <laughs> right, to, to be accountable right, yeah. on a certain matter and so on. So I think this internal democracy is often overlooked when the democratic innovators want to uh, reinvent or reform mm -hmm. democracy, normally they think about uh, local community elections, municipal elections, all the way to the national. Yeah. Uh, but actually, on large organizations' uh, governance, this is a very low hanging fruit mm -hmm. because every leader in a large organization wants to listen at scale what's actually happening. Yeah. And they want to engage with the collective intelligence of. The staff is just that, again, limited by 150 people's uh, Dunbar limits. Um, there's no way for me to arrange one-on-one -on -one conversations with each and every uh, mm -hmm. staff member. So collective intelligence tools uh, is my priority in my ministry, and I dedicate the rest of my day <laughs> to prepare uh, to the answer of the collective intelligence. Yeah. Wow. I'm curious, what do you do on a Sunday? Mm, on a Sunday, I go back to my family. So my family is in Danshui. Uh, and so both of my grandma uh, are still around, uh, and my parents, and so on. And so I spend time with the family. Yeah. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Do you want right. to say something to the audience? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, if you have uh, contributed to open source, uh, open culture, for eight years, uh, please do apply for a Taiwan Gold Card. Uh, it is a three-year residency with health benefits, bring your family, and so on. And if you live in a jurisdiction in which dual citizenship is permitted, on the fifth year, you can also get a Taiwan passport without giving up your original one. Uh, so <laughs> being also Taiwanese is a important direction uh, to connect to the world. And if you're young and have not contributed for eight years yet, uh, since kindergarten or something, um, <laughs> just let me know uh, your contributions and maybe we can work something out and live long and prosper. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.